Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Find Your Edge. My name is Jordan Nagoli, and thank you so much for joining us here today. On this episode, we are joined by Mike Lugo. Mike is the founder of Lugo Boxing and Fitness, which is a staple gym in the Atlanta boxing community. Mike and his team have trained and produced numerous national champions, international champions, and Olympic champions. Mike was also recently awarded with the Coach of the Year from the Georgia Amateur Boxing Association. Mike is a general overall badass, and I'm grateful to have him on the show today. Mike, my brother, welcome, sir. I appreciate you having me. Thank you, man. Thank you. So, all right, man, on this episode, and I was just sharing with you before we started, I have seen you coach, I've seen your athletes box, and I've seen the way you train with them. So I do want to talk a lot about your boxing philosophy and how you train, but I don't know a lot about your story before boxing, and I would love for us to dive into that a little bit. So we'll start with your story, and then we'll, we'll dive into the boxing. But before we jump into anything else... How do you describe Lugo Boxing and Fitness to someone if you're just talking to them and you meet them on the street or out and about? Um, if I meet someone that, you know, not from the boxing community and I'm trying to, I'm never trying to sell anybody Lugo Boxing. You know, I, I never sell us. I, what I do is promote us. Um, you know, I would, I would show them video. I would uh, show them results of not only awards and titles that we've gotten in the ring, but also like lives that we've changed. Um, I have numerous kids in my gym that, you know, they're never going to be, and uh, they're watching, don't take this bad way. They're never going to be, you know, that super professional. Um, they're going to be great athletes, but through the sport of boxing and through what I'm teaching and coaching, you know, we've, We've helped them to become better people, to be more confident, um, you know, not to not to walk around in fear or doubt of themselves, but to just be be bold and I think overall just be better people. I see so many so many parallels between boxing and martial arts. And with my martial arts background, you know, I got into it because I struggled with a lot of anxiety, anger at myself fear yeah internally and externally so i'm really excited to dive more into that when when we talk about the boxing but let's dive into your journey and and talk about your story so let's just go back to where where were you born um i was born in hammond indiana it's um say northwest uh city right outside of chicago um that's where my mother and my father went to high school and they met and i was born there um, after that, my dad joined the Navy. We went to California for a short time. Then we moved to Masawa, Japan. Um, I was in Japan for maybe four or five years. My little brother was born there. Um, did a little bit of martial arts there. Uh, nothing that I retained. Um, then moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and was pretty much raised in Florida. Um, so my parents divorced, my dad went back up north, and summers we would go to Chicago, and throughout the year we'd be in Florida. So you're the oldest? Yes. And have, you have one younger brother? Yeah, just one brother. One brother. Do you have memories of Japan? Oh yeah. Tell me some of the things you remember from Japan. Um, I remember the, the street festivals and my dad and all his Navy buddies, they used to have these wooden cups, they were square. And as the floats would come by on the back of the floats, they'd have like these huge kegs of sake. And these guys would be, you know, running around. If you had your, your cup, they would run up to you and oh, sake, sake. And you give them the cup and they'd sprint over there and they'd come back and just, I mean, like every float that came by, you get a refill of sake. How old were you then? I was, I think I was six or seven. I just remember all the Navy guys uh, being really, really drunk. Yep. Yeah. And they can drink. Sake is no joke. Yeah. It's, it's super good. Um, I remember in the wintertime in these abandoned parking lots, they would do these huge like ice festivals and they'd have um, rides, but they're all carved out of ice. 
And I remember we went to the supermarket and the, it was closed down, but there was really nothing keeping you out of it. And my dad said I could go over there. So I went and I climbed this face of uh, some Japanese character and I got stuck up there. And my dad had to come uh, <laughs> get me off of it. Just being a kid. Yeah, just being a kid. Having a good time. Uh, what was it like having a dad in the Navy? Um, I mean, it was... My dad was my my superhero, so it didn't matter if he was in the Navy, Army, or or none of the above. You know what I mean? I I looked up to him more than just you know in in the physical form. He was he was everything that I aspired to be. Um, he he taught me and my brother, you know, we have to take care of each other no matter what, even if the world falls down around us. That that we have to grip onto each other. Take take uh, responsibility for each other and take care of our mom. And what did he do in the, in the Navy? Um, he was on the flight deck. I think he directed the planes and everything. Mm -hmm. Not exactly sure. Just going based off pictures. Yeah. So how old were you when you moved to Japan? Uh, I think four. So as a four-year-old, probably... Do you remember it being difficult transitioning there or too too young to even remember? Um, I mean, I, I have vague memories and then, you know, I have stories from my mom. So I'm kind of like piecing those together. Mm -hmm. I know when we first moved there, there wasn't room on base. So we had to live off base and it was um, a house maybe a little bit bigger than this. Wow. Um, earthquakes were very real. Um, and when earthquakes happened, everybody came outside and just grabbed on to like a a vehicle or whatever was outside um i remember the insects being really big but then again i was really small so good point um i guess it's all perspective were you in a school on base with other american students or were you integrated into japanese school um no i was uh, in school on base so i didn't get to be integrated and and no one spoke English, like where we had to stay for two or three months. I mean, it was real. I remember my mom uh, having real difficult times and just trying to communicate. And I mean, everybody loved her, but it was still really, really hard on her because my dad was at work all day on base and it was just me and her. And then she was pregnant. So she had to work really hard um, just to try to, you know, get groceries and get things for the house. It was really difficult. Just simple questions to communicate become a lot harder. Yeah. You know, back then there's no Google Translate. I mean, it was it was real, real difficult for her. hand gestures and a lot of Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what well, you moved there four years old, you said you're there for four or five years. So come back to Jacksonville. Jacksonville, Florida. Around nine. What was that transitioning like from Japan to Florida? I mean, I loved it. It was, you know, I wanted I wanted to be back in America. I love I love Japan and their their culture and um just every I love everything about it. Um but I also wanted to be in America. You know, I'm from from here. This is this is where, you know, all my family is. Um and then plus moving to Florida was really really cool as a kid cuz you know, Walt Disney's in Florida. I didn't know Jacksonville was so far away. But all I knew is that Walt Disney was in Florida, so I was going to be close to that. I'm a Florida boy myself, born in Fort Lauderdale, so okay. I, I love Florida. Right, I do too. Far from Disney World still, but it's the Florida vibe. So did you say your parents separated while you lived in Jacksonville? Correct. How old were you then? It wasn't, it wasn't long after we got there. Um, maybe 10, 10 years old. What kind of impact did that have on you? It was huge. Um, You know, and I, I didn't understand how the real world worked. I just knew that um, my parents were separating. Uh, it took me a couple of days to really understand what that meant is, you know, parents are not going to live together anymore. Um, I didn't know if they didn't like each other. I didn't know if they didn't love each other anymore. Um, and I think most kids that go through a divorce question is it you know did they do anything wrong did they upset them um and so it had a really really hard impact on me 
how quickly after did your dad leave? Um, he stayed around for maybe six months. Uh, he lived off the next major street, so I got to see him a lot. Um, and then he ended up filing bankruptcy and moved back up north with my grandparents. Was he still in the Navy at that time? No. No, he had left the Navy. Yeah. How, how much younger is your brother than you are? Five years. So you're 10 years old. Your brother's five. Right. And you're both living with your mom. Correct. She had a lot of responsibility on her shoulders. She did. Um, she started working for Home Depot. <clears throat> then she started dating um, this other guy who eventually became my stepfather, who introduced me to boxing. Um, but he wasn't a good guy. You know, he came, he came in at first and he appeared to be a good guy. But um, as time went on, you know, he was abusive, um, bipolar, I'd have to say. Um, and just for the next, let's see, that's 10, next seven, seven years of my life uh, was just really, really rough. Abusive towards your mother? Uh, definitely abusive towards my mom, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, he would put hands on her, and you know, as a young man, I would try to defend her, and I would become the focus of his anger, his, you know, his his rage. He had a lot of rage, and um, he never really like beat beat my brother. Um, he would spank him, and then you know, uh, just just talk really bad to him. Um, break him down emotionally, um, and and for some reason, you know, um, me and my me and my mom are super good right now, like super good. She's you know she's queen of my world. Um, but I, as a young man, I always questioned like why we didn't leave, why couldn't we just go? And and that's something that my mom has a lot of regret with because a lot of uh, stuff happened in that time frame. Did you ask her that at that age? Did you ask her why, why can't we leave? Yeah. Um, so to kind of like, like bring you up the pace, you know, we went up, we went up North for the summer. My mom was dating him. When we came back, they were married. They went to Whoa. the courts, uh, got married. So it was a huge, um, you had no idea, no idea. It was a huge surprise for us. Um, and at that point, you know, again, he wasn't wasn't bad. Like the facade was still up. I see. Um, and you know, he moved in. We're in the west side of Jacksonville. Um, got a dog. You know, nice little family. Um, I went into sixth grade, and I was going to a sixth grade center, and it was in a pretty rough area, and I was fighting a lot, a lot and getting in trouble all the time. So my mom and my stepdad decided that it was time to move out of the city. So next thing I know, we're packing up and we're moving to Putnam County. Putnam County is like nothing. It's, it's a lot of woods, a couple of lakes, and not that many people. Especially back then. Especially back then. And um, so it, you know, it was a, a huge shock for me, huge culture shock. Um, so we moved to Putnam County. They, they, uh, got five acres of land. My stepdad's originally from Texas. So he's, uh, he's a, like a ranchero, like a, a rancher from the farm and stuff. So he got horses. I mean, we're out there building fences, building barns. Um, and it, it almost seems like that once we were out there, you know, we're kind of isolated. And that's where, like, he really, really started to become more and more abusive. Again, it started small, would build up, um, and my mom would argue. I would try to, you know, I would yell at him for yelling at my mom, and then it would escalate from there. Um, he put hands on my mom many times, hands on me many times. Um, you know, as a and as a young man, you know, you try to fight, try to fight back, but this isn't the movies, you know, a little kid's not going to beat up uh, 
a grown man that's intent on causing harm. Um, but then right around that time also, I got into the boxing because of my stepdad. My stepdad used to box also in, when he was a young man in Texas. So started doing that. Um, nothing, nothing on the level that, that my boys are on, you know, uh, taught me fundamentals, foundation. I was already a fighter. Um, so I kind of infused that. Um, but like I said, things got just progressively, progressively worse with my, my stepdad, especially, like I said, being out there in the country, I felt it was almost like, um, isolation, you know, that's, and, and knowing what I know now as, as an adult, that's what abusive people do. They like to isolate, pull you away from, from others so they can, they can impose themselves on you. So you guys are on five acres of your own property in the middle of nowhere. You're 12 or 13 years old. Your brother is five years younger than that. Right. It, do you think at any point your, your stepdad knew what he was leading you to and, it, or, it, or it grew over time? Um, leading me like towards what, what do you mean? I mean, he brought you guys out into the isolation. It sounds like he was kind of hiding what he had inside of him. Yeah. I mean, I mean, definitely like he, I think, like I said, I think he was bipolar um, because, you know, it wasn't bad 100% of the time mm -hmm. there would be, which makes it actually worse because there would be times that he would be okay. You're having a good time. And then all of a sudden he just snaps and you're like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where'd that come from? Um, then on top of that, you know, my dad's up North. Um, so I don't get to see him that much. Um, it's really, really weighing on me. Um, I go up for the summer and it was, I think the summer of 93, you know, we go up, my dad was really sick, really, really sick all the time. And, um, and I just, you know, I'm, I always watched my dad, you know, as, as a kid, and I know this from having children now, like your kids are always watching you, even when you don't think they're watching, like they're just watching you. And so, you know, I was watching my dad. He was always sick. And I would talk to him and uh, be like, hey, dad, like what's like, what's wrong? You know, like it's like, oh, you know, my stomach and, and my dad started losing weight. My dad was really, really in shape. And um, but he was a ladies man, like big time ladies man. Um, and you know, just something in the back of my head back then, I wanted to ask my dad if he was being safe, but I didn't, you know? And, um, and I remember that summer, my dad had a, a yellow notebook pad and he was sitting at the dining room table and he was writing. And then I was watching him from the front room and something like, you know, my inner, my inner voice was like, telling me that he's writing his will. And um and we finished the summer and you know we went back went back uh to Florida and you know my grandma called me a couple months later and she's like, Mijo, you your daddy's really, really sick. You know, he might have to go to the hospital. And um and he went into the hospital and he came out and I talked to him and um he was just losing a lot of weight, um, not doing well. And then in January um, of 94, I get a call and it was from my grandmother and she told me that we needed to come up. We needed to come up and see my dad. Uh, so she talked to my mom and, and everything and we made a road trip and my dad was in the hospital. And so we go and, you know, me and my brother get there and we have to go to this room, you know, and put on a mask. And, and I was confused, like, like, why do I have to put all this stuff on this, you know, see my dad. And uh, so we go, you know, we put the mask on and we go in and my, my grandmother, she's prepping us saying like, Hey, you know, your dad, he looks bad. And he, um, he hasn't been talking to nobody. 
Um, so again, I, you know, I wasn't trying to hear that. We go in and it shocked me like to see my dad in his condition. Um, and at the time, you know, like a lot of people didn't talk about it or whatever. Um, but my dad, he contracted HIV. Um, and then turned into AIDS. Um, so it was, it was like, right, even right now, it's, it's hard to even like visualize him. Cause I have this, I have this picture in my mind of my dad of just being so strong, so fit and so full of life. And, um, but when we walked in, he looked at us and he smiled and he started talking and, and we spent the next three days with him and, you know, and, and the same things he always told us, Hey, you got to take care of each other. You got to take care of your mom. Um, you know, things didn't work out between me and your mom, but you know, I, I still love her and it, it was my fault uh, for the divorce. And, uh, so <clears throat> we spent those three days with him. Um, we left, went back home a couple weeks later. Uh, came home from school, uh, received a phone call, and you know, my my dad passed away. And it was such a moment for me. It was one of those like it's an anchor on my timeline. You know, it's it's where everything stopped, and and it's difficult. Like even right now to this day. It's it's difficult because um you know I revert I always revert back to you know what what he told me and I teach that to my boys um you know take care of each other take care of your mom even even though me and their mother are not together um and they they still have to take care of their family. So that was, you know, that was a really, really difficult time for me as a young man. Um, and then you compile that with uh, my stepfather. He was, at, for, a, for a moment, he was okay. He was compassionate. Um, but then as time went on, you know, he would go back to his ways, become abu abusive again. And then, and then he would say things about my dad, you know. Um, which which would tear me up you know um he would say things to my brother um uh he like i said he never put hands on my brother but he would go in there and and whoop him and then say you know you got to be a man you know if not you're going to be you're going to be a faggot you're going to grow up to be a faggot you're going to grow up to be gay you're going to you know you're going to be a sissy all your life and then i would go in there and 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 defend my brother and he, he would whoop my ass, you know? Um, so, you know, the emotional, um, impact that, that, that time frame had on me was huge, was humongous. How old were you when your father passed away? Um, I was 14. And yeah, I was 14 years old. 14. Your father passes away. You have to go back home to an abusive stepfather. You're going through changes of your own as a teenage boy at that time. How do you, how do you process that? How do you even try to keep pushing forward? You know, especially as, as a kid, I, um, you know, I grew up watching like Star Wars, you know, that was, that was my, my thing. And I used to believe like I was destined for greatness. Like I would look at the stars, you know what I mean? And like, I'm supposed to be great. And it was just, it wasn't an arrogance thing, but it was something I felt. And, um, and I remember, man, just. Like, you know, I have to, I have to focus on this. I have to, I have to achieve it. 
like at all costs. Like I'm, I'm already, I, you know, my, my mind frame was I'm already at the bottom. Like I, I just took these losses. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, what do I got? What else do I have to lose? And I mean, looking back, I could have lost a lot more, but that was my mindset. Like I have nothing to lose. Um, so I was, you know, I was an athlete, I was a natural athlete and I ran track. I played football, basketball, anything. Didn't matter what the sport was. I could do a box. And so I decided, you know, that football season that I was going to dedicate that year to my dad. Um, I'm on the varsity team and we have, uh, I think it was a jamboree back then, you know, where you get like multiple teams and they just play a quarter. I did great. I killed it. Um, first game of the season, I shatter my ankle. I shattered my right ankle and it was on a bum play. I wasn't even nowhere around the ball. Um, I had to get six pins, six screws. Um, oh, it was destroyed. It was, no, it was shattered. They had to rebuild it. Um, but the doctor was saying, you know, with the proper healing and then rehab, you could come back fully with maybe two or three games. So I, had a little hope left. I had my cast on. I go through that whole time frame, get my cast off. They do another x-ray just to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. And the doc left bone fragments in there. So I had to cut me back open, remove the bone, bone chips. And that, that killed my, killed my season. And, and again, another like, what I look back as like a critical time for me. Um, I started getting into a lot of trouble, um, acting out. Like I said, I was, I'm, I'm a fighter by nature. And, you know, I have all this, now I have rage. I have anger, I have disappointment. I got like all this hurt and I don't know how to process it. Um, and I'm not going to say I was hanging out with the wrong people because I was fully aware of everything I was doing. Um, I started breaking the law. I started breaking into places, um, stealing things. And a lot of those things I was stealing were firearms. Um, and of course, I ended up getting caught. Uh, went to juvie, got expelled from school, um, put on juvenile probation um after that my mom and my stepdad decided that it was time to move from there and we moved back towards jacksonville we moved to jacksonville i'm i'm 16 um i'm really i'm really feeling myself as far as as a young man like I'm starting to talk back to my stepdad a little bit, you know, um, that invincible feeling almost, but I, I was still scared of him, you know? Um, so we moved back towards Jacksonville. I got, um, community hours left to do. And, uh, but I only had like three, three or four hours left to do. And, um, my stepdad tells me to, you know, go finish. He had me out in the yard, cutting trees and doing yard work. So I'm, I'm completely, you know, dirty. Um, so I go in, I remember this so clear. I go in, I get some, uh, lemonade and I had a Chicago bears hat on cause I'm a bears fan. And, um, he comes in, he says, you know, go put on some fucking respectable clothes. And so I turn around and I say, you know, they got me digging fire pits fuck am I going to put on some clean clothes for? And I walk away from him. And I walk towards my room and I remember him rushing up behind me. And, uh, you know, he smacked, smacked me in the back of the head. The hat flies off. We end up on my bed. He's over me, just choking me, choking me. And, um, 
and I couldn't really get no leverage. And then eventually I did. I got him by the back of the head, pulled his head back, uh, started hitting him. We ended up standing up and, well, before we stood up, he grabbed my right ankle, the one that was the injured one injured you know previously broken and just turned as hard as he could um i kicked him yes when we stood up and in back of my head i'm like okay this is you know this is where he gets me um but he didn't um you know and i i i attacked him my mom came in seen me attacking him um i i, I kind of put it on him um, she sided with him at the time and, you know, they went into the bedroom and then they're yelling and arguing. And, and so I remember my, my little brother coming in my room and I was sitting on the edge of my bed and my little brother comes and gets behind me and he like starts giving me like a shoulder rub and he's like, Mike, man, you did it, man. You did it. Wow. And I was like, you beat him, man. You finally beat him. And, uh, you know, it made it made me feel really, really good. But at the same time, I knew something was going to happen. And so I said, hey, Chris, man, you know, first of all, I love you, man. But you might want to go to your room because I don't. So my stepdad's a little crazy. And, and he, you know, he taught us to shoot guns. He taught us everything about, about weapons. And so part of me thought he was going to come back in there and shoot me. So. I definitely wanted my brother back in his room. Um, I went and opened up the window. So in case if I seen him coming, at least I could run and jump out the screen. Um, so he came back, but, you know, thankfully he didn't have, have a gun. And, you know, he started yelling at me, saying he was going to violate my probation. Um, he was going to send me to prison, that I was going to be getting fucked in prison. God. <laughs> So, you know, I stood up and challenged him again. He left and my mom went back in the room. We're arguing. Um, and then finally my mom came back in there and she's crying and she says, look, he's not going to violate your probation. Um, but when you turn 17, he wants you out. Um, so I said, you know what? Like, we don't have to wait for that. Like, I don't, I don't want to be here anyways. Um, so I packed a bag. I had the car that my dad owned and left to me. And for the next three, four months, I was homeless, living in the car. Um, every once in a while, staying with a friend. Um, but I couldn't do that too long. You know, I could stay weekends or something. Um, and then eventually, um, there was this lady, I think she knew my mom somehow, and she had a, tr a small trailer for rent. And she let me rent it for like, I don't know, two or 300 bucks. So basically just looking out for me. Um, lived there for a little while. And I got in to the streets heavy, really, really heavy. Um, I started robbing dope boys. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, if you were if you were a dope dealer and you had any type of weight, any type of uh, money, like I would come see you. I would take what you had, and that's kind of how I started establishing myself in the Jacksonville area. Um, and I was crazy. Like I didn't, I didn't wear a mask. I didn't, it didn't matter to me. Like if you're in the game, you're, it's, it's fair play. Were you aware of the risk you were taking at that time or you didn't care? I've always known the risk. See, that's, you know, that's like the difference I think with myself. Like a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I, hang, I hung around the wrong people or I didn't know the consequences. No, I was very, I've always, I'm always of sound mind. So, I mean, any, any actions that I took, I took, um, I just, I just didn't care at the time. Were you getting into any drug use at that time too? 
I've not done any drugs. I've smoked marijuana a little bit, and that's the extent of my drug use. I'm I'm actually super against drugs. I mean, they destroy lives. Big time. Doesn't matter who you are. Correct. So you're, oh my God, man. You're 16. You stand up to your stepdad. Was it painful that your mom sided with him? We went through a long period of not speaking. Um, so when I was homeless, uh, my mom was at some antique place and she wanted me to come up there because a caseworker was up there and wanted to see me. And this was shortly after I was out of the house. So I go up there and my mom had already spoken to her. Um, I have bruises all around my neck. I mean, completely around my neck. I have bruises. From your dad choking you? From my stepdad. Your stepdad choked me, sorry. And um, so I go in there and I talk to the lady and she's asking me where I live. And I told her, you know, in that car out there. Like, and um, she wasn't there to help me. She was real um, accusatory. Definitely on my, my mom, my stepdad's side, saying that, you know, I, I struck them, that I was uncontrollable. And, and I never denied uh, striking him or attacking him. But I said, you know, it's funny. The one time that, that I do, that I'm wrong. But all the years that, that he's done this to me and my mom, nobody held him accountable for. But, and the lady was like, you know, I need you to come in and I need you. I said, I'm not coming in anywhere. You know, You're, like, what am I here for? Are you here to help me or like justify him? And, and I showed her my bruises. I said, like, I can not do this to myself. You know, this is what he did. This is my stepdad. This is somebody that's uh, in, a, in a parent role that is supposed to take care of the household, not supposed to destroy it. And um, and she just kept saying, you know, that that it was basically that I attacked him and he had to defend himself. So I just stopped talking to her and my mom and I left and I was really, really, really hurt and upset um, with my mom at that at that point in my life. Why do you think no one was able to hold him accountable? And I ask that because this is this is not the first scenario where I've heard where this has happened and, and the the father, the, the man in the house was not held accountable. I mean, I'm not I don't have a, a, a clear idea of why. Um you know, again, I think isolation, I think um breaking somebody down mentally can be worse than physically. You know, on these five acres of land, we made a, uh, a gun range in the back. And the weekends that we were there, we'd go shoot. He'd teach us how to shoot. We'd break the guns down, clean them. Uh, he'd have his buddies over. We would shoot. And uh, I remember one, one Saturday morning, got us up early and we'd go out back. But that Friday night, um, like he whooped my ass big time, thought my nose was broke. Um, and we go out there and, you know, he parks the truck, sets the, sets the targets up. And, uh, I think he had a 1911 at the time out there. So he takes it, pops the clip, looks me in my eyes, hands me the gun and says, shoot. Um, I remember he just beat me down the night before and I felt what he was doing here. He's mentally breaking me down. Oh, you don't like what happened last night here? Shoot. You know, and he gave me that gun. I looked at him for a little bit, took a deep breath and I shot the target, you know? And he would do things like that to 
to mentally just just break you down. Like you're not gonna do nothing. You're gonna accept this and this is the way it is. And and we did. I'm sorry you had to go through that, man. That's it's disgusting to, to even hear back and have to hear that. So you leave at 16, you get heavy into the streets, you're robbing dope dealers. What happened from there? How long were you doing that? Not long. <laughs> um, That's not very sustainable. It's not sustainable. Um, money was good. Um, I was partying. I'm, I'm 17 now. I have my own place. I mean, I got all the money a 17-year-old could want. Yep. I got all the weapons. Um, I mean, I thought I was the man. Um, and one morning, uh, some detectives knock on the door. Mm. And it's kind of funny, actually. Uh, so I robbed this this weed man, and he actually called the cops and told them that <laughs> that I and my partner robbed him for his trash bag full of marijuana and all his money. So, you know, they tell me that. They say, hey, it's kind of weird, but uh, this guy says that you robbed him for his drugs. And, you know, I played off, I don't know then. You know what the fuck you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Um, but little did I know, they had already been building a case on me. Um, not long after, they uh, come, get arrested. They take everything out of the house. We get locked up. Um, I end up, I think, getting sentenced to nine and a half years in prison. Uh, Florida State Prison. Um, so for, I think, the next, I did eight, I believe, on that. Next eight years um, in prison in the state of Florida. Um, and that's, you know, that's a whole nother, uh, chapter of, of, of me, my life, which actually leads to a couple other humongous chapters that led me here to Atlanta. Is that okay to talk about the, the time in prison? So you... Were you so you're under eighteen, but were you charged as an adult? Absolutely. Okay. Charged as an well, adjudicated as an adult. Um sent it to the to the Florida State prison system. Um I first went in, there's uh there, at the time I think there was four prisons that they called youthful offender prisons. So they were twenty five and under. Okay. Went to Bavard CI, which is um, out there kind of close to Coco. Um, and it was dubbed uh, a gladiator camp. Like, you know, you get all these, just think about it. You get, you know, 17, 1800 kids that are sentenced 25 and younger. There's, there's going to be a lot of conflict. And, and there was, there's a lot of conflict. I have so many questions now. So you're charged. What, what's going through your mind once you realize you've got to, you got to face this time in prison i didn't care i had i had zero cares I, well i had one care at, at that point in my life i had only one care and that was about uh my baby brother um like i said my mom at this point in time like we weren't really talking um again you know felt real just real hurt um, by everything. Again, I still I felt she chose him over me, um, and this and this is something that that we freely talk about now. You know what I mean? Um, but but that's that's what it was at the time. So, t tell me about the journey of of going into prison and what you had to experience there. Um. So again, you know the. Bavard was a very um, violent, super violent prison, um, more so than the adult prisons. You get, you know, you get adults and they, they know how to do time. They know how to uh, be at peace sometimes. Um, the youngsters, like, 
There is none. It's everything. Every day is 100, 100 miles an hour every day. Um, I mean, which was easy for me. I mean, that's how I was living anyways. Um, but then we get into a deeper, a deeper part of, of my story. Um, so where I'm originally from, you know, it's, it's heavy, heavy gangs up north and we have affiliation with the Latin Kings. Say it with the Latin Kings? Latin Kings, which is what I am. Um, so the brothers are already there. You know, there's already a set, uh, an organization, a structure at this prison. They know I'm coming. Um, so I'm welcomed. Um, I'm basically taken care of. Um, like I said, the that prison was super violent. So, you know, you got to you got to put your work in. Um, when you say work, does that mean fighting or does that? I mean, definitely fighting. It could in, it could entail other things. Um, a little bit heavier than that. Yeah. Um, but I stayed there for about about 18 months. And then we had a riot and kind of tore the prison up. Then National Guard came in, locked everybody down, and shipped everybody four corners to the wind. Um, I ended up at Lancaster CI, which is was a remedial uh, youthful offender camp. So it was like a military uh, boot camp style prison. I had a really tough time adjusting to that one because I was so defiant. Um, so that's much more structured. Well, you know, the officers are very, um, it's, it's like boot camp. I mean, they're in your face, you're marching, you're doing PT at five in the morning on the basketball courts. Um, there's phases or there was phases when you come in, there's phase one, then you go to two, which is like the general population. And then if you do really well, with no write-ups and you go to phase three, which is a more of a, um, like a honorary, uh, dorm or something like that. But, uh, we never made it to that one. Um, so anyways, I get to Lancaster kind of just, uh, take over that, that prison, as far as my people go, I run it, structure it. Um, we do our thing. We end up having another riot. Um, can you can you explain a little bit for people that may not understand what a riot actually means in prison and the repercussions of that? Um, so so a riot in prison. I mean, it could be as it, what they dub it as on paperwork. Um, like when you get a disciplinary report, it's a, a disturbance of, I think it was like 25 people or more. Um, and so the, the problem that I had at Lancaster was we were beefing with another set, um, uh, the folk nation, we were beefing with them. They, there was a lot of these guys, um, not so many of us, but all of our guys were like really strong individuals. Um, we kind of laid some law down. They didn't like it. And so they got all their guys and we got all our guys and we just kind of went at it. It spilled over to the rec field, to the, to the compound, to dormitories, um, you know, probably for about, I think seven or eight hours we were in full riot, oh my God. uh, before they got like national guard to come in and laid everybody down. Cause at, at that point, prison guards cannot stop that. Yeah. They just have to get out of the way. So the second riot happens, mm -hmm. what happens from there? Same thing. We get locked down um, and we get shipped. Now they're shipping everybody. They're not sending us to youthful offender camps anymore. They're, they're sending us to, you know, the adult uh, uh, camps. And I think at the time, Florida had like 58 prisons. Um, so they scattered us. Um, and then I ended up on closed management one, which was, uh, 37 months in confinement. But, you know, if you do four or five months without a write up, they, they'll drop you down to the next level and the next level. 
So I made it out of confinement probably under a year. Got out of confinement, went to the compound. Um, and now, you know, this is an adult compound. You got much older people there. It's a lot more calmer, which, uh, which was a surprise to me. You know, I didn't, I, as, a, as a young man in the youthful offender camp, you're thinking that the adult prison is going to be way more, you know, lit than where you're at, but it's not, it's, it's for us, it was much more calmer. Before we jump into the adult prison, you said confinement. Are you? Does this, does this mean you're in solitary? You're alone? Yeah, solitary. 24-7? 24-7. The only people you see is people that bring food and the guards? Yeah. I mean, you know, depending on how the the dorm is set up, if it's a butterfly dorm, uh, you'll have the, when you come in, you'll have the, you could see a cross and maybe see other people cross the, the cell block. What What was that like on your mind? In the confinement um i'm like i said i'm pretty um i'm pretty of sound mind always have been yeah. like i'm very for for me i'm very okay with with me you know i'm very um a lot of people go to confinement and they do a couple of weeks and end up going to psychological emergency because they can't handle it and you know, and, and that, I think that comes down to because they don't really know who they are and their self starts speaking to them when you're alone and they, they can't handle it. They don't know, they don't know how to process that. And so a lot of people have troubles. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah. So going on to the adult prison, it was not as lit as you said as you thought it would be it wasn't you know it wasn't as wild um de i mean definitely structure you know and then you know you have all the sets and the the organizations they still run and it's a lot more business business oriented as opposed to the youthful offender prisons where it's just everybody's just there to bang and fight and uh see who's tougher than everybody when you say business what what is what does that manifest to uh, i mean you got you got the dope game in prison which is huge. Um, and I think around this time they were taking out uh, tobacco. So that, that became a huge market. You get cigarettes in, um, you know, that's, that's going to be a major source of income. They were uh, taking out meaning it was legal before and they stopped it. So yeah. They used, it to, con okay. yeah they used to sell uh, tobacco on the, the canteen. Got it. Um, you know, people make, they call it hooch or buck, you know, the prison wine. You always get, you know, three or four guys on the compound. They're the, they're the local, uh, bootlegger, you know, they make their money. Um, uh, people hustle food out of the kitchen. I mean, every, you know, everything is business oriented. Gambling is huge. You got your bookies. Gambling is, is major. Um, so everything is just way more business oriented. And again, you have that in the youthful offender, uh, camps, but like I said, it's more, it's more just wild. Everybody's there to see who has, you know, the, the bigger chest while at, at the adult prisons, you know, you know, these motherfuckers are there to live. A lot of them are doing life bids. They're never going home. They don't want to go spend a year, two years in confinement when they could, you know, live their life, see, quote unquote, you know, run their business. Build a life within that life. Yeah. For some, that's all it is. That is life, you know? So how long were you in the adult prison? Uh, until I EOS in 2003. What is EOS? Uh, end of sentence. So how many years was that? About eight. Eight, and then how many in the adult prison? Well, total. Oh, total. eight. So when I when I I'm different. I'm I'm saying adult prison, and so it's still Florida prison system. Yeah. They just try to segregate at first the okay. the youngsters that come in. You know what I mean? Um. So there is no like separate. Uh, prison system it's all the same prison Got system it. it's just you fucked up over here we're trying to keep you away from all the adults you know the older the Got old it. heads maybe you only have 10 or 15 years so we're going to try to keep you over here as opposed to putting you up here where you're going to really possibly be corrupted and become even in their minds you know uh, a better or more uh, savvy criminal got it so they're trying to almost prevent you from going down a 
worse path in that environment that's already yeah that's difficult. that's what the youthful uh, offender prison system is set up for is to give them some type of remedial change they, so they offer a lot of you know vocational like you have to take these classes got it um when at the adult prison it's optional you can if you want to you know what i mean now in the adult prison was there still the latin kings affiliation did you have that access, that access of there okay. um and that is actually when i like started to take over florida Explain that. What do you mean by that? Um, so I'd put in a lot of work in the prison system, and I have I gained a lot of notoriety. Um, and when I went to the quote unquote adult system, I thought that I would be around brothers that had a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and I found the opposite. Um, There's a lot of ignorance. And I became a teacher of of our our manifesto of our of our ways of what we stood for, what we believed in um, and I was also you know a person on the front line, like I would never say, "Hey, go do that." If I would say anything, it would be, "Hey, let's go do this." So I always, in anything I do, I lead by example. Um, and that stands true to today. Um, so again, you know, I started to really make a name for myself within the nation. Um, and when I came home, I was called upon. Um, didn't really want to plug in right away. I wanted to, you know, it was my second day home. That quickly. Yeah. Um, didn't really want to plug in. I was going to, but I wanted maybe a couple of weeks, you know. You just got uh, out. Yeah. And uh, when you say called upon, by whom? Uh, who was who was running the state at the time? And um, went and seen him. He didn't like a couple of things that that I said while I was in, but um, I said what I said. I stood my ground. He respected that. Um, shortly after, I came to hold some uh, position within the state. Shortly after that, I took over as enforcer for the state of Florida. Um, this was in 2003. Um, no, that was 2004, 2005, I took over the state completely. Um, 2006, I was hit by the feds, ATF, DEA, ICE, Homeland Security, um, gang, gang unit, every agency you could think of. Um, they crashed down upon my house and took me into custody for, RICO, conspiracy to RICO, and probably a hundred other charges. They arrested 52 of us. It was national news in 2006, May 25th. What happens next? Um, Nathan was 23 months old. Elijah was in his mom's belly. Um, I fought the case for I think 39 months, 37 months, I was in single cell uh, isolation. You went back. I was fighting the case. I was incarcerated, no bond. Um, Elijah was born while I was fighting the case. I didn't get to see him be born. Um, had some really great attorneys, um, thankfully. Um, there was about seven or eight of us that they dubbed as in people of influence. So they had all of us on 24 hour lockdown. Um, through the course of that 38, 39 months, um, I would say 80% of 
the people on the case uh, flipped against myself and others. But luckily for us, the the confidential informant they used was dirtier than everybody that they arrested. And we started to expose that. And we found lots of loopholes in the cases, lots of holes in their cases. And um, we ended up beating the charges. It took about 39 months. Um, but that whole time, um, I was in single a seven by 11 uh, cell. For the month of February, 2007, I didn't come out of my cell at all, not to shower or use the phone or anything. Cause I had a little spat with one of the officers back then. They locked me down. Uh, no shower. They wouldn't allow you to come out. They wouldn't allow me. It was my disciplinary uh, uh, action. But we beat the case, like I said, uh, we beat the case in court, um, but I still had federal charges and I couldn't, I couldn't beat the federal charges. So I had to plea out. Um, I ended up getting six and a half on that. Um, but I got time credit for all the time I was in. Um, so in a couple of years I was out, um, in those couple of years while I was in the fed prison, um, Angela, she, um, you know, obviously was having hard times, uh, money wise. She moved in with her family. Um, that situation wasn't working out anymore. So my mother who had moved to Atlanta, um, said, Hey, come up here. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pay us anything. Just come. And so she brought the boys, packed them up and moved to Atlanta. During this time in prison, when did you, you and your mother reconnect over that time? Because this is, let's just so I, yeah. I, I'm having the timeline right. It's 17, you're in the first right. eight years to 25, right. you're out again. You go back after four years? Almost, almost four years. Okay, so four years, so around 29 ish. And you're then in for, so you already served 39 months and that was time credit and you had six and a half years. So you're looking at right. 29 to, 35 ish about 36 at what point did you did you and your mom reconnect so me and my mom i mean we connected so when i when i came home in 2003 let me back up 2001 i'm in confinement i got into uh i got into a fight i busted this dude up and i'm in confinement for like 30 days right so i'm back there and i don't receive mail I hardly ever get mail. And um, this is after 9-11. And, you know, the officers calls mail calls. I don't even get off my bunk because I don't get no mail. And uh, But he slides a card under the door. So I say, oh, shit. I jump up, <laughs> get it. And it's from my mom. I haven't heard from her in a while. You know, I open it and it, and I still have this card somewhere but it has a cat with like a little tear and it says, I'm sorry. And so I open it and, um, you know, it's one of those blank cards and she just, she wrote her, yep. her message in it. And basically she said, you know, Hey, you know, after nine 11, um, you know, it really makes you reevaluate things and family and those you people you love. And she's like, I just want you to know there's been some changes in my life. Um, me and David, who's a stepdad, um, have gotten divorced. Um, I'm no longer with him. I'm going to be moving to Atlanta soon with the corporate office in Home Depot. Um, just want you to know I love you and I miss you and, and I'm sorry. So, so from there, you know, we started yeah. reconnecting and building and everything. And, uh, but I remember sitting there on my bunk like, like, man. I, I felt so, had such mixed emotions. Like, I'm so happy that she's not with him. But like, fuck, man, like, doesn't even affect me now. You know what I mean? Like, I remember waking her up. I had a book bag packed. And like, like, mom, let's go. Let's, let's just go. Let's leave. And 
and this is going to upset her when she hears this, but she told me, she says, you know, I'm not because when you guys grow up, you guys are going to leave and I'm not going to have anybody. And I remember just like, you know, but, um, but anyway, so that's, that's when, you know, when we started reconnecting and building and, and everything has been great. And, and we have, we've, we've talked about this many times, Yeah, you know, we might even talk about it this week <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's part of, it's part of our journey. It's part of her journey, you know, and, and I understand, I don't agree with it, but I understand as a woman, you know, she was abused and then she, you know, she thought she loved this guy too. You know, he would do things to her and then apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I love you. And, you know, um, so she was, she was confused also. So I, I definitely don't hold it against her at all. At the time I did now, you know, like, like I said, she's, she's my everything, you know, I take care of her. Um, so that's, that's when we reconnected over that time. Yeah. So you said Angela moved up to Atlanta with, with my mom, with your mom. Yeah. And how much longer were you in prison for before when, or when she first moved up here? Um, not, not too much longer. Because I remember her sending me a letter and she says, Hey, I put the boys in boxing. And I'm like, You did what? Um, and she's like, Yeah, you know, it's it's nothing like that. You know, I'm uh I'm doing cardio kickboxing class and they have a kid's boxing, so it's better than them just sitting on the iPad. And so I felt real I felt kind of twisted about it a little bit because she knows I, you know, I boxed and um, if anybody should be teaching, it should be me. Um, yep. And then, you know, this like really gets into the, you know, the boxing story. You know, I come home and I go to one of the practices and just watch. And they put Nathan in the ring with this kid that, I mean, he just had, he walked with more mechanics than Nate did. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> Put him in the ring to spar, which I was a little shocked at. And, at what uh, age was Nate? Uh, Nate was six, six, going on seven. Yeah. And um, kid just touched him up immediately, busted his nose, bleeding, he's crying, <laughs> takes him out of the ring. You know, I go over there, make sure he's okay first. He says, yeah. And I said, hey, man, you know, you don't, you don't have to box. He's like, no, daddy, I want to box. I want to box. I said, okay, if you're going to box. I'm going to teach you. And he said he wanted to box. So I pulled him out of that. I joined the gym and we would just come in and go off in the corner and do our own thing. And other parents started seeing the progress that Nate had. I would take Nate back every other, every other week over there when they started to spar and put him in the mix. And he started to um, get the better of everybody and it just, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I eventually ended up taking over that kid's boxing class for the gym. Um, ended up finding out about USA Boxing, getting Nate enrolled into it, and started his journey um, that he's on now as far as you know, being a boxer for USA Boxing. So what year was that, what you just described? Nate getting touched up by the other boxer, you starting working with him. What year was that? Uh, 2011. 2011. So we're coming up right at 10 years ago. Yeah. So from there, you start with Nathan training him. Walk me through that journey. Um, start training him. Um, you know, we're training at home also. We're members of this gym. Um, another guy joins the gym who ends up being uh, a really close friend of mine uh, with his son. His son was two years older than Nate. His name's uh, Floyd Schofield. And, um, you know, he came into the gym and was like, you know, my son's been boxing since he was two. And so I, you know, I have a very, like, low tolerance for what I think is bullshit. 
So I said, man, he ain't been boxing since he was two. He ain't been doing nothing since he was two. <laughs> and so that that right there kind of like starts our relationship. And uh, he says, oh, hell yeah, man. You know, he's been boxing since he was two. And uh, so we end up sparring Little Floyd, that's his son, yep. and Nathan. And Little Floyd can box. He was a great boxer, especially at that age. And I think they ended up sparring like 35 rounds. Oh, my God. Um, neither one of them would quit, and me and Big Floyd wouldn't <laughs> quit. Um, and, you know, we became, we became a team for a while. And, you know, we, like I said, we started competing in USA Boxing, traveling, uh, going all over the place, um, networking, meeting new people getting new opportunities. Um, from there, we left that gym. Um, I ended up at Hard Knocks. Um, and that was just kind of temporary. And we knew that. And then I was training this other kid named Anthony and his dad, his name was Mike also. And he used to buy liquor from the liquor store where we're currently under. And um, me and him wow. had been talking about, you know, we need we need a place of our own, man, because at 8 p.m., you know, some sometimes on slow nights, these gyms, you know, they cut the lights off on us and um, and we're just we're just getting started. So he went up there, he bought his liquor and asked uh, his name is Mr. Wynn. He says, uh, hey, man, you know, we're looking for a spot to rent. Uh, we want to possibly put a boxing ring and. He says, I got a spot downstairs. So he went, showed him, called me the next day. I met him there. My first response was, hell no. Hell no. And this place is, I mean, it just, I mean, it looks like a dungeon. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the price was right. Um, we, talked to, we talked about it a lot, had a couple beers, talked about it. And we decided that if we had no paying customers, could you cover your half? He said, yes. And, and I said, yes. And we pulled the trigger on it. Um, had a lot of cleaning to do. And just, you know, over the years, we got bags at Goodwill, flea markets, yard sales, um, donations. Um, and eventually, slowly but surely, built um, that dungeon into what Lugo Boxing is right now. That is incredible, man. What a, what a powerful story to lead you to where you are today. Yeah, there's, you know, I, I'm all about progress, man, and, and you know, boxing, boxing is a sport of redemption. And a lot of people, like I said, my people, they, they know my story. And, but a lot of people don't that are close to me. They don't know where I come from. They don't know what I've been through. And never saying that what I've been through is any worse or greater than what anybody else has been through. But, you know, to come, to come from where I've come from and one be of sound mind, I think, I think is, is good. It's a plus. Um, but you know, what, what I'm teaching is that it doesn't matter where you come from. You've could have experienced way worse things than me or nothing even close to me. It doesn't matter. You know, we all have our own demons that we deal with. Um, but can you can you take those experiences that you that you've had and can you still be a good person can you do it um and it, and it's not just lip service cuz anybody can say oh yeah i can be a great person you know i can i can put these things on social media and i can put these great motivational quotes and those are cool and i do them sometimes but but like, what do you, what do you do? What are your actions? Like, who are you helping? You know, um, 
I, you know, I come from the bottom, like the bottom, bottom, bottom of what, a, what an officer told me at one time, the bottom of society, you know? And it's okay though. You know, I don't, I took that again in a positive way because I could choose to stay there or I can rise up. And when you decide to pull up, um, especially if, if they've already dubbed you at being at the bottom, all you're gonna do is make progress. All you're gonna do is make more and more progress and, and people are gonna see it and they're gonna wanna be a part of that. They're gonna wanna be a part of something positive. You know, my lawyer, I had two lawyers, I love them to death, Leanne and Deanne. They said, you know what? If you would take your organizational skills and apply it in a positive way, you could do anything you want to. And I said, you know, you're right. You're 100% right. Because if I can get 2,000 thugs, dudes from the street, to listen, and follow rules, <laughs> there's no reason that we can't bring up these kids that need structure, that need a positive uh, male influence. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I, I, I also, also train a lot of law enforcement. Oh yeah. And these guys, these guys know my history, you know, and the ones that there's some that once they found out they didn't want to associate with me and that's that's fine i get it 100% um but the ones that have chosen to to stay at lugo boxing you know they see they see what we're doing and they see that we are changing people's lives in such a positive way and that as one of as one of the law enforcement officers told me you know this is why i became a law enforcement officer to see change, to make a difference. And like, you have done that. You have went from this side all the way to this side. You used to be, and you know, in their terms, a problem in the community. And now you are a positive outlet for the community. So again, you know, boxing for me, it's, it's my redemption. It's, I go back to when I was looking at the stars when I was a young man, kid. Like I'm gonna be the next like Luke Skywalker. You know, I'm gonna change the universe. And when that didn't happen, I, you know, I had a moment of like, damn, almost let down, like within inside, deep inside. And and then years later, I remember uh coaching i think we were at the 2016 junior olympics and we clean sweeped we won we won everything my whole team won and uh i you know i came down off the ring and uh, you know the boxers are getting their their medical checks and everything and i was just kind of sitting there like i am i am supposed to do something great it's just not like I thought it was, you know what I mean? I'm not going to be the one in the front, but I'm going to be the one teaching. I'm going to be the one guiding, preparing, you know, and, and I'm good with that. I'm so good with that. You know, I look back and like I said, looking at those stars, like I never would have thought back then that I would be where I'm at now doing what I do um and it's and it's a, you know it's a it's a really um gratifying feeling I have goosebumps man on my arms from hearing you share your story and I want to thank you for being vulnerable and honest because I don't think every man would be willing to share their past and thank you for sharing your redemption story and and the journey you had to take to get to where you are today. 
And I think that leads us perfectly into talking about Lugo boxing and fitness and what it is today. Even before present day, what year did you guys sign the lease for the gym underneath the liquor store? Um, 2014. 2014. Yeah. And you would split that with Floyd? No. So Floyd had kind of drifted and he was training at home, training at a couple of the gyms because he was also a personal trainer. So, you know, he would, uh, he would end up training his son where whatever gyms he was doing his personal training at. Um, my, at the time, business partner was a guy named Mike Reeves and I was training, uh, ended up training both of his sons. And it, from what it sounds like, it starts with you, your two sons, him and his two sons. Yeah. Anybody else joining you guys at that time? Um, no, we were, like I said, we were the, the only ones there at first. Um, and then he met, uh, some guy through work or something that had a younger brother who ended up being our first um client paying client yeah. client you know he came in there and uh boxed and then from there you know started putting flyers at after school just word of mouth we're we've always been more word of mouth than anything um because my vision for for lugo boxing has never been about is having huge numbers. It's it's never been about that. It's been about having a place to train my kids at any time I want to. Um, and if we get, you know, some some other great boxers in there, awesome. You know, but again, it's never been about the numbers. It's always for me. It's always been about quality. You know, I'm not. I'm not here to do the boxing boot camp stuff. That's cool. That's great, but that's not what we're doing. Like we're, we're training a combat sport and that takes, that takes a lot of time and that takes a lot of responsibility on my part. You know, I have to, I have to teach you first of all, to protect yourself. That's, that is the number one thing that I, I need to teach you is to protect yourself. And I can't just do that in a, in a boxing boot camp setting. It has to be serious. It has to be intense, and it, it has to be real. I'm glad you brought that up. Can you explain the difference between training a combat boxer who is going to fight other people and someone that might go into a cardio 60-minute boxing boot class? Again, nothing wrong with right. either side, but explain the difference because I'm not sure a lot of people do understand that. I mean, you know, the, I mean, the major difference, and I'm just going to, I guess, speak freely, is um, the boxing boot camp is for anyone that is looking to get in shape. Um, they're not looking to strike anyone or be struck. Um, they might not, you know, they might look at that as, as violent, um, but but it is a great workout. And like I said, you know, if you're counting calories, you're counting steps, um, it's an amazing workout. Boxing is an amazing workout. But a boxer that is going to compete, it is much more serious because it is a is a combat sport, it's a blood sport. Um and they have to protect themselves because, you know, you you could literally die in the ring. Somebody could hit you and you could die in there, you know? And, and again, that, that burden, that responsibility comes to the coach. Is the coach teaching you correctly? Is he preparing you for what's going to happen? Um, are you just doing cardio stuff? You know, you have to be able to protect yourself and that there's a big difference in cardio. You're not protecting yourself. You're just go, 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 go. Let's get the heart rate up. Let's sweat, you know? In real boxing or any combat sport, you know, there's going to be exchanges. You're not just going to punch somebody. You know, we have a little saying, you know, if you, if you punch us, we punch you back. <laughs> um, and so that's, I, I guess that's the layman terms yeah, that's of, a great description. Of, of the difference of them. You know, um, it's super serious. And, and some people don't 
think coaching is a quote unquote job, but it is you, it is a job and it is a responsibility to protect your fighter. That's, that's my number one job is to protect my boxers. And that encompasses, you know, not if they're just in trouble in the ring, but it also comes down to my training. Am I training them correctly? Am I preparing them? You know, are we just looking flashy? You know, I just put out like a little a video not too long ago about counters. And a lot of times, uh, some of these coaches, they do this touch, 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 and they look good. It's fast. It's nice coordination, you know, but in real sparring and in real, in real fighting, you block, you're going to feel that full impact from your opponent. And if your coach isn't giving you some heat, when you finally feel that real impact, it might throw you off. So that goes back to your training, preparing your boxer. You got to prepare them to block real impact, not a little touch and fake. Like everything we do is applicable to the ring and applicable to fighting and preparing them to protect themselves. I'm glad you brought that up. How would you, how would you describe your coaching style? Um, so I think I'm a mix. So typically you have, um, like your, your Mexican style fighters. Those are more like what we call like the bangers. They come forward, they bang, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna dog fight you. You know, they can take a shot. They're going to give a shot. Um, and then you have like your slick boxers, the ones that are moving, their pop shot in here, good defense. I'd, I'd like to think, and maybe some people would think differently. Um, I like to think that we're a pretty good mixture of, of both. We, we, we box off angles. We love to use our jab. I like to counter. I love body work. Um, so again, I think, I think we're a good mixture of the two banger slash boxer you mentioned you love body work and for everybody listening i'm not a boxer so i am trying to ask questions as people that don't box or maybe are interested in boxing and want to learn a little bit more about it so you said that you love body shots do you think there's an overemphasis of trying to knock somebody out when you could win a match or beat somebody with aggressive body shots um so here's here's kind of the problem like in the amateurs um it seems at times that a lot of the judges don't really give a lot of uh, credit to body shots unless you put them down, you know, um, but that's still within the scoring area. Um, and, and it seems that more of the headshots are given more value, so to say, but, you know, we're not training. I'm not training my guys to stay amateur. Our end goal is the pros. Um, so, you know, once you get into four rounds, six rounds, eight rounds, 10 rounds, and eventually 12 rounds, you going after somebody's body is going to literally break them down. Um, you know, some people are just built tough, like around the, around the jaw area, like you could hit them with a brick and they're going to, they're not going to go down. And that's not no discredit to you. It's just a credit to them. They're just built tough. But everybody's anatomy is the same in the body. Everyone has ribs. Everyone has ribs. Behind those ribs, they have kidneys and livers, or liver. And it's gonna, you apply that pressure, you land that shot correctly, it's gonna shock and the body is gonna shut down. It's just science. I don't care what you do. So again, we love body work. Love, love body work. Um, some people are just built tough and that's a credit to them but everybody's built the same in the body. When you are training with fighters and let's say they're preparing for a specific opponent, or actually, I'll, I'll flip it on you. In the amateur boxing world, people take your sons. Do you know who they're boxing previous to a tournament per se? Um, in a tournament, a lot of times we'll have a list of people that are in our bracket. Um, and we won't know exactly who we're fighting until the until they do the draw, um, which is pretty soon before the fights, right? Yeah, it's maybe a day out. Okay. okay. Um, so I mean, we have we have a good idea, and then you know we'll we'll scour over social media, we'll 
hit YouTube, see if there's any video. And then, you know, a lot of times we, we fought a lot of these guys before, you know, Nate has 234 fights. Oh my God. Like. And he's 17. He just turned 17. 234. Yeah. So, and I mean, he, he's, there's a lot of people we've seen already, you know? Um, so very rarely are we going to come across a, a style um, that we're not familiar with. And if, and if we do, that's great. That's, we're adding that experience to our tank and, um, and we'll make adjustments. As a coach, how do you stay sharp and continue education feels like a weird term for it, but yeah, how do you yeah. continue your education and sharpen your skills to better yourself? So uh, again, it just comes down to studying all the time all the time you know um there's there's a thousand ways to do things um and i don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it if it works it's good um but there is a foundation for how we train um but me studying other boxers me reading um and there's also tactics to things, you know, there's, um, positioning in the ring. You might land a really good shot, but only two judges seen it. And the three, the other three didn't see it. Oh, I didn't think about that. Um, so we have, we have like code where like, if we're going into the third round, we'll call out the code and it will remind the boxer to position themselves where the majority of the judges can see the shots. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So you, I don't want to say the word perform because it's it's not a show you're putting on, you're fighting, but you have to show off to the judges. Absolutely. I did not know that. Um, and again, you know, judges are only supposed to judge punches that they see land. So if we have a judge that's behind me and you hit me with a shot, it snaps my head back. But this judge didn't see your glove hit my face, but they seen my head snap back. I mean, that would tell us that you landed a good shot, but they didn't see it. So they're not technically supposed to judge it. Um, so if there's a judge behind me, a judge behind you, but I got two judges over there and then one judge over there. So you have three judges, the majority of the five that just seen that clean shot. So that shot is definitely getting credit, even if this judge and that judge don't see it. So ring positioning is something that is a major, major factor in close fights. And that's something that, that I have to stay aware of. Um, like I said, you know, studying other boxers, um, styles, techniques. Um, every once in a while, there's a boxer with a really unique technique. And a lot of it might not apply to you because maybe only they can pull that off, but there's always something they do that's a little bit different that you could take and kind of add to your arsenal. Um, you know, a, another thing that I, that I do is when, like when my boxer loses, when we lose, I have to, I have to evaluate myself first. I can't just be pissed off. Um, I got to evaluate myself and did I make the right calls? Did, did I make my instructions clear? Um, were they the right calls? Should I have done something different? You know, and, and this is a very emotional sport too. You know, everybody's very invested. Um, and I, and I still have, and I'm still working on that too. You know what I mean? Like there are times where I get super pissed off about something that a fight we lose and I have to reel it back in. I have to reel it back in and kind of check myself. And, and once I do, and if the instructions were clear, if I made the right calls, then I need to have a conversation with the boxer. Could you not hear me? Why weren't you doing this? You know what I mean? So it's a, a system of checks as a coach that I feel I feel all coaches should do that. You know, you got to check yourself first. And then if everything checks out, then you check the boxer. Um, but a lot of time coaches jump immediately. It's the boxer's fault. Mm. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. As opposed to saying it's never, it should never be the boxer's fault. It should be our fault. We lost or we won. It's never you lost, you know? And I hear that a lot, but, but again, this is nothing I'm perfect on either. It's a continuously check yourself, check yourself, check yourself, you know, um, studying, networking with other coaches. Some, some coaches have different philosophies Yeah, and it's not right or wrong. It's just different. Can it be applied? If it can, great. If it can't, I don't need it. Would you say that when one of your fighters loses, and not even just your fighter, but a fighter in general comes back to their coach, are they, I'm trying to think of the right word, fragile's not it, but you you almost hold their confidence in your hand, depending on what you say to them, can send them down a downward spiral yeah. or can lift them back up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I've, I've, I've been guilty of both. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's real important, man. And it, it is a constant, you know, as a coach. So a coach told me, another, another coach that kind of used to give me a lot of wisdom a while ago. He would say, you know, as a coach, you're not just a coach. You're a brother. You're a father. You're a teacher your shoulder to cry on, your, you know, you're that, that voice that uplifts. I mean, you're all these things. It's much, it's much bigger than coaching. So yeah, you have to be super, super careful on, on what you say, especially after a loss, because they are fragile. Their emotions are so high. Yeah. And then especially, you know, if, and we don't think about it, but especially if they feel they let you down and then you pop off on them, and then, you know, they're, they're really just emotionally drained after that. And they're like, man, you know, you just kind of crushed them when we could have said something different to make it okay and build on it for, for our next um, match that's coming up. I ask that because we've had the opportunity to work with you at two boxing events. One was Lugo de Mayo, actually more than two. Yeah. And then another was the Smoking Guns. And we had the opportunity to stand ringside. I've done martial arts my whole life. I've been to UFC events, but I've never sat on the side of a ring while grown men and women, for more or less, try to kill each other and win. And it was electrifying. And the people that won were on top of the world, and the yeah. people that lost were broken right. in, in that moment. And it was really interesting. And I, I, was, I felt privileged to see the raw emotion on both spectrums. It was, it was just fascinating to see. How do you balance being a father and a coach to your boys? It at first it was really really difficult. Um, I would take everything personal. You know, if we didn't get a call, um, if other people were saying things in the audience, you know, I'm ready to have a fist fight with them. And they um, say crazy yeah, stuff. People say all kinds of things. Um, but. <clears throat> I'm very disciplined. Like I'm very disciplined and I'm very patient. Um, so within being disciplined and, and having patience, I had to separate the coach and the dad. And it was hard at first, but now after experience, it, it's, it's pretty easy for me um, because I look at everything technically. I don't, I don't look and say, okay, this is my son boxing, even though it is. Um, is he technically winning? Is he doing what he's supposed to do? Um, is he listening? So it's, it, you know, it took a while, but it can be done. But you have to have discipline. And you can't have those rose-tinted glasses on. You know, if, if my boys lose, I'll be the first one to tell them, like, hey, we didn't get that. We lost. Um, and then there's been times where, you know, we didn't get the call, but I felt we executed and I felt they listened above everything else. As long as they listen, I'm always going to be happy. You know, we can't control what the judges do. Um, if they listen, that's, that's all I want. You know what I mean? Cause it, cause it shows that, that level, that level of trust with us and our connection. Cause 
you've been to events and it is electrifying, like you said, and then sometimes it's super loud. Can't hear anything. But they can. Yeah. You know, and you know, you've been, you've been in martial arts and with your sensei, you know, he, that voice resonates with you. It does. So now the benefits of training my boys, they've been hearing my voice forever. And now they're trained as a boxer to listen to their coach's voice, which is also their dad's voice. So they're going to hone in on that, I think, a little bit more than everybody else. It, it's hard to describe unless you felt it. But when you're in a room with a few thousand people or a few hundred and it's echoing off the walls, but you hear your coach's voice come through, time, time does stand still or time slows down. Yeah. And obviously, as you get more experience, when you're first starting, it can be quite hectic yeah. and scary. But once you compete and you've been hit and you've lost and you've won, then you start to know, oh, okay, I need to relax, take a deep breath, process what's coming at me. Right. And then you hear your coaches. And I have been guilty of not listening and listening. And you, you pay the price. Talking about judging a little bit, on a state, the national and international level, is there quite a wide discrepancy in how people judge and how do you guys manage that because you compete worldwide yeah um there's definitely uh differences in in judging on state national and international um depending where you go state wise you could go to a state that has some really experienced judges you're going to get some really fair and technical judges and that's always great but then there's times where you fight in these really hole in the wall cities and they have uh you know newer judges and they haven't had a lot of experience and it's okay when you have like these really small novice bouts where the kids are just throwing their hands throwing their hands throwing their hands you know and that's what a lot of those judges see. They don't see the real technical experienced boxers. So when you do get, you know, a couple of experienced boxers in front of some of these local judges, they, I think, revert back to who's throwing the most punches. They don't see the blocks or the counters or, you know, they're, they're not giving the, the true credit to those things. So sometimes you can get the raw end of the deal. If you're a, a very experienced boxer boxing at a a small, small city, uh, or just a place where there's not that many experienced officials statewide. Nationally, it's a little bit better. I mean, you're supposed to have, you know, the best officials from around the country, and for the most part, you do. Um, and I think for the most part, they they do a pretty good job. You know, everybody's gonna be upset about a call here and there and complain if they didn't win. But I think for the most part, on a national level, things are things are pretty good. Um, they use five judges instead of three. So it, it's, it's a lot more fair. Um, so even if you do have a bad judge that maybe he doesn't like you or she doesn't, you know, like the way you're dressing, you know, they, uh, the other four will outweigh that. Real quick, that, that happens? People, judges are judgmental? I mean, it's, there's a human element to it, you know, there, there's no getting around that. There's no instant replay. That's every sport too. Yeah. There's no, uh, you know, you want to challenge that call. Once the call is made, that's it. You can't change it. Um, international can be rough. Internationally can be rough because a lot of, a lot of Americans aren't traveling and fighting internationally. And so a lot of these international judges, they don't see America that much. Um, if you have a close fight, it's probably not going your way. You have to dominate. Um, and that's, and I think that's a, I think that's what they expect from America. And if you don't dominate completely, then you've lost. So I mean, that, that's just my experience that you have to bring it and, and show why you're fighting for America. Yeah. You know, America's a powerhouse and it just automatically resonates with all these 
other countries like okay this is these are the cowboys you know they're the shoot first ask questions later they better they better dominate and if not if you have a close fight it's it's probably not going our way i was curious because we have similar experiences in the martial art world very much so depending on the country that you're competing in and this is worldwide not just for our martial art but kind of across the board yeah if literally what you said if you don't dominate and and clean the floor with them you're going to lose yeah and you'll have calls but i in 2015 i was competing in a in a tournament and i man i got disqualified in the championship match and it was a, it was a japanese judge that judged differently yeah and at that time i did not handle it well let us just say i left and punched my hand through a locker and completely lost it yeah but in hindsight it doesn't matter i should have followed the rules in how he was judging right and really it showed that i was not at the level of black belt that i wanted to be i was a beginner black belt mm -hmm. i was not an advanced black belt and I'm actually really grateful I got disqualified because it was the best learning lesson for me, which was, hey, wherever you are, there you are, humble yourself and learn that some people may not want you to win, but win inside the confines of what they're allowing you. Right. And it was, it was a tough lesson. It is. But talking about, let's talk about winning. I know that you and your team and your fighters have had a tremendous amount of success. How do you? How do you balance a fighter's ego? Because when you want to fight, you feel like a badass, and then you start to feel invincible. How do you keep them in check for not getting too overconfident? That that is a constant um, battle for me. With with uh, especially my oldest boy Nate. He's a badass man. He he's a touch hog, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Um, anybody that's been in the ring with him, they know it. Um, you got guys that are pros right now that are like some, some big name pros and they say the same thing. Like, this is a bad motherfucker, man. And they, you know, at a time, like they're saying these things, he's like 15, 16 years old. Um, well now he's a grown man. He does not, he's not a kid anymore. He looks. Well, I mean. At 17, I was a badass, but I wasn't the badass that I was at 17 as opposed to 23, 24. You know, I was, I was much more mature just physically. So he's still, I mean, Nate is still growing as a, as a man. Yeah. You know, and his experience is amazing. Like he puts combinations together and, and right now he has, his ring IQ is off the charts. What does that mean, ring IQ? Um, what he sees, what he processes, what he does has nothing to do with me. I, what is the name of the training tool? It's hanging off the ceiling. It's a massive ball. That, it's pretty heavy, and it swings back and forth, and he's dodging it. Oh, the aqua bag. Aqua bag. Yeah. Okay. I, in my research for this interview, I was on his Instagram profile. And he had a slow motion video right? Like of him. And I'll, for everybody watching this on YouTube, I'll, I'll post the video in there so you can see. But he's watching the aqua ball and dodges it not even a half inch away. Is that an, an example of ring IQ? That's an, yeah, that's an example of ring IQ. Um, you know, your boxer, you've, you've gauged their range. So, you know, you don't want to move more than necessary because if you move too far you're going to take yeah. yourself out of position and he barely to counter moved. um so yeah that's you know that's getting back to his ring iq his timing um and timing is setting up your your counters um but again man there's there's things that he sees you know when he was young Gur, he comes to the corner i give him instruction I give him two or three in instructions he goes back out he executes he comes back now when he comes to the corner, he's giving me feedback. Wow. He's telling me what he's seeing, you know, and it might be the same thing I'm seeing, but now we're, we're collaborating. We're truly a team. I'm giving, he's giving, we're both receiving. 
we're both processing, we're both in that minute, in the chaos that's going around, in that minute, we have our little eye of the storm and we take our little moment of, of calmness and sync up and then go back out into the storm. Um, and Elijah is getting that right now too. Elijah's coming to the corner. Hey, daddy, you know, he's, when I'm throwing the left hand to the body, he's blocking, he, he, he's anticipating. So I'm gonna fake low and then loop it up top. You know, and I'm like, okay, I didn't see him doing that, but that's something he sees. And he's telling me, that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it becomes, yeah. it becomes a, a communication. It becomes, uh, like I said, real um, team in the corner, as opposed to me just telling them. Um, and the same thing with Sarai, the little girl I trained. Yep. Um, and with all of that, all of their ring IQs, you know, Nate, I think Nate has the most ring IQ. Elijah and Sarai are nipping at his heels. Um, there does come tremendous ego with that. And I, I, I tell them all the time, I say, you know what? I want you guys to have so much uh, energy in the ring that it's almost disrespectful. Like people have to look twice, like is, is, he, is he being disrespectful or is he just being aggressive? Um, but I don't want that out of the ring, you know? So there's, I want all these things in the ring, but I don't want it out of the ring. And it, it, it is a very fine line because, you know, let's be honest, these are fighters. I mean, and they're not just fighters. They're, they're good fighters. They're warriors. <laughs> they're warriors. It's warriors, man. And, and it's hard for you. A, a warrior doesn't just stop being a warrior. No. You know, that, that, like that old saying of, uh, you know, you'd rather be a, a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So <laughs> it's like you could be in the garden, but you're still a warrior. Yeah. He comes out of the ring. They're still warriors. So it's. They're going to have that, that, that cockiness, you know, but you don't want it to be cockiness. You want it to be confident. It's but a fine line. There's a super fine line. And it's, and it's just something that, you know, I think as a coach and then as a dad, it's not something you can say, okay, guys, today we're not going to do this anymore. No, it's a continuous checking, checking them, reminding them, um, I think one of the things that we do good in the gym is we, we have the guys and the girls with a lot more experience always helping the newer guys. So it kind of, it kind of humbles them a little bit. They're still teaching even when they're winning. Right. Um, There's always that next generation to go to. Yeah. And, and we got a, we got a good wave of, of new guys and some of them really, really follow, you know, my boys and Sarai on social media, like way before they came to the gym. So it's almost like they're looking at them like starstruck. Like, oh ah. my gosh. And then and then for them, you know, they're like, like, what are you acting like that for? I'm just, you know, I'm just in the, I'm like you, just a boxer. It's fascinating that social media gives that perception. If, you know, John sees Nathan or Elijah kicking ass in tournaments and then on social media, they glorify that person hey, we've right. all done it I, I do it with athletes all the time yeah and then they come in so that that's that's a good way to to keep them humble let's talk about the what makes up a champion and specifically what makes up a champion boxer if if you could and it doesn't have to be perfect math you know is it 30 percent your mind is it 20 percent your hand speed, another your footwork. How would you break down what makes up a, a strong champion in your mind? I mean, I would, I would. We could get into percentages, and again, everybody's going to have different breakdowns. Yeah, of course. I think, I think it's definitely like seventy-five percent at least mental. Really, it is. It is mental, mental, mental. Because you can have all the the physical attributes and and be, I mean, just physically a, a beast. But are you are you mentally here? You know, I've I've seen people come in my gym 
that are not the best in shape, um, that are not, and I mean, these guys are training. It's not like they, you know, just came in off the street. Like these people are training and they're just not as gifted or uh, don't have the hand speed or the footwork. These are things we can work on, but some people are a little more uh, gifted in others in those areas. But these people are mentally locked in. They will do whatever it takes. They will train three or four hours longer. They will show up two or three more days than everybody else. They will not stop. So the for me, the mental aspect is, is everything. If you don't have the mental aspect, I don't care how good of an athlete you are. You know, you have to be present. And if you're present, we can work on anything else that we need to. But if you are mentally present, which I, which I think is at least three quarters, you know, the, the rest is power, speed, timing, distance. I mean, these are all, again, those numbers can be shifted around on that. But I think you need to be three quarters mentally present. And for people that are listening right now that maybe don't have that mental fortitude right now, would you agree that something like boxing or another sport, I'm a big fan of martial arts, right. can get you to that level? Absolutely. Um, any type of you know, real combat sport is going to give you a, a mental discipline that you know, they, they, may, they might not have even thought was capable, um, especially if they get with a good, good teacher. I mean, that's, that's very important. You got to have a good teacher. Because let's be honest, there's some shitty, there's some shitty people out there that are teaching and that are just taking money, you know. And and like in some in some of the um, karate dojos, you know, these kids, these parents are are paying for belts. You buy your black belt when you start, you know, and you're setting that that kid up for failure because he thinks yep. that he knows something, and he's gonna get punched in the mouth. By somebody, a bully or something. He's gonna get hurt. Yeah, and he's and he's found out in a, in a bad way. He's not prepared. He's not mentally prepared for that. So you have to be you have to be with the right teacher, hundred percent. I totally agree. Let's talk about actual physical training for a second. I've watched again in my research a ton of videos of you holding mitts mm -hmm. and pads for. And I'll just use Elijah and Nate as an example. You guys are in sync with that. Yeah. It, some of the time, it doesn't even look like you're speaking. A lot of times we're not. You're not. Can you just share how you... it? I would describe that as flow state. You are flowing together. Yeah. How did you, how did you get to that point in training? And how do you guys do that without even speaking now? Um, well, first of all, you got to have a good relationship with your coach. You have to have that. Um, we had Jake Paul at the gym, I don't know, three or four months ago. Yeah, just a couple months back. And him and his coach, the mitt work, horrible. Horrible. Because Jake Paul paid for that coach. There's no connection with them. I see. The connection is his routing number and bank account. That's it. <laughs> That's the only connection <laughs> he's got. You know, like with us, one, we're connected. Like these are my children. Yeah. Um, but but with my team. You know, we sweat, we bleed, sometimes they cry, throw up. We do all that together. Um, you know, and if, if people spend enough time, real time, around each other, you automatically start to sync up, especially if I'm teaching you something. Um, and that's just how energy works. You get energy around other energy and they are good with each other, they start to come together. Those energies start to work together. And that's, and that's what it is a lot, what you see like on the mitts, um, when we talk, when I'm in the corner. Um, and with our mitt work, we, ha we do have um, counters, and, I, and we call this our keys to counter. Um, and I might start you with just like a one-two. Yeah. And then I might, you might block on your right side. The right side has a certain return. The low left has a certain return. Got it. The upper left has a certain return. So these are all based off because you never know where your opponent's going to go. 
and we could come up with with set drills and sometimes we do um that's just training and repetition um but when i throw a punch and they block it there's an automatic punch they don't know where i'm going i'll throw a punch low they block they counter up top they counter and we continuously build off of that and that that does take time because it's reaction time but those are things everything we do is transferable to the ring when you're fighting because you're not going slow yeah. and if they miss you they'll get hit yeah which which is a good thing and it happens yeah it it's, happens we just don't post it <laughs> <laughs> now i know that nate all all your fighters are currently amateur yeah okay can you describe to the listeners the difference between amateur and professional well the main thing is you get paid as a professional, um, professional, there's no headgear. Uh, the gloves are, are, um, I think eight ounce, which is much smaller. Um, amateur, you know, headgear, um, bigger gloves, shorter, shorter rounds. Um, no amateur bout is over three, three rounds. Um, it's a different commission. So, I mean, those are just the yeah. basics. What makes what makes someone stay an amateur for a prolonged period of time if there is money in boxing? And again, I'm asking from try to be an ignorant point of view for right. people not knowing. Um, the reason that people would stay is to try to maybe make the Olympics. Okay. Um, you know, Olympics. Can you not make fourth? the Olympics if you're a professional? No, once you go, you can't come back. They they had um they had an exception with uh, some of our guys this year, but it was based off points, and I don't think they had a professional fight yet. Um, but staying amateur, maybe you need more experience. You know, if you take a couple losses in amateurs, it doesn't doesn't mean anything. It's not going to hurt your payday. Um. And then there are, you know, there are stipends. Like once you make Team USA, you could get some stipends and you could make a little bit of money. Um, and I think that's more for the females because the females make substantially less money in the professionals. Um, but they could actually make some good stipends staying with USA Boxing if yeah. they make Team USA, if they do, you know, based off like how many gold medals you get internationally and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, it all, you know, it all comes down to personal choice, like what situation you're in financially, if it makes sense to go pro, then you have to do what's right for you and, you know, your family. Speaking on the financial point, actually, in an interview I was listening to that you gave, you said that boxing is a poor man's sport and that you guys do it for the love of it. And yeah. I know you you and I have talked about this before, but what makes you stay in as a coach and continue to help people like this when I know there's not a lot of money in it and you definitely could make a lot more money doing other things? Yeah. Um, I mean, what what makes me stay in it is the reason I got in it is, you know, I describe I describe us as we're this train and me and my boys are this train and we're going this way if anybody wants to come with us you can you can get on and come with us we're not going backwards and we're not stopping you can jump on and go with us our goal is always to be professional champions of the world from the time they were six and seven years old that was my vision and over time, it has become their vision. Um, and what I've realized that along the way, that I can help this person. I can do that. I can help here. I can help there. Um, because I'm able. I'm able to, to help. I'm able to, to work with these kids. And I know how to teach boxing. It's not, and it's not a... It is a job, but it's not a job for me. It's what I love doing, you know. Um, so again, it's 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 not difficult for me, and I'm able to help, um, because I have I feel I have the ability to, and 
And along that way, we've picked up a lot of people that are coming with us that have decided to say, hey, we're going to go where you're going. You know, we're going to follow what you guys are doing. And we're going to, in some cases, you know, with some of the families that we have at the gym, we're going to add a lot of value to you guys also, you know, which makes the aspect of our team. Well, you just said the word families, and that's what I see and feel whenever I'm at your guys' gym. It's it's a family yeah. that teaches boxing and, and trains others, but it's a family at the core. It, it's absolutely a family. Um, you know, like like my other my other coaches that I have, like these these people are, you know, priceless. Um, I have uh, uh, Sarai's father, Sheik, yep, and their whole family. Um, like these people are my family. Um, Palmer, Mark Palmer, he's the he's my tall redneck. The um, beard, yep, big beard. <laughs> like he's my family. Yep. Um, Rhea, she's she's one of my coaches slash boxers. You know, it's my family. You know, and and again, you know, just living life, and I I think you can uh, you can say the same thing too is that. You come across people for certain reasons. They're supposed to be in your life and there's no blood connection, but at times they're closer than blood. Um, and that's and that's how we run that's how we run my gym. My gym is a gym, but it's my house. Mm. When you come into my house, you need to speak. You don't just come into somebody's house and not speak to them. Yeah. You know, and and like I said, everything that we do, man, is is family based. Um, and and I'm and I'm very very happy with that, you know. I resonate with that deeply. Yeah, very much so. Let's talk about the success of Lugo Boxing and yeah. the the championships won. When I don't I don't want people to have a misconception. When you guys first opened, I'm sure the walls were bare. Nothing was on there. Nope. And again, I'll link up photos and videos. When you look at this gym now, it is lined with championship belts. It is lined with trophies and posters, all of which were earned with blood, sweat, and tears. Can you speak on the championships one? Um, right now, currently, and my numbers might be off a little bit. That's okay. Um, Lugo Boxing, we have 59 national championships we have three international golds two international bronzes um one two three four uh four team usa spots um multiple boxer of the year awards uh coach of the year awards Outstanding Boxer Awards. Um, like I said, Nate has 234 bouts. Elijah has 189. Oh my God. Sarai has a little over 70, which is a lot for a female. Yeah. Um, a lot harder to match up. Um, uh, coach with Team USA. Um, I'm the president of Georgia Boxing. Um, the chairman for the Junior Olympics, the Region 3 coordinator for the Silver Gloves. Um, we have a lot of uh, – Sheik is the secretary for Georgia Boxing. Um, so we have a lot of uh, accolades at the gym. Um, but, but above all that, I think, I, I think we have a responsibility to – continue you know and and that becomes difficult you know once you have a certain level of success um people expect that the expectation is is something that that we have to maintain and this is what i tell my guys all the time like you know you guys are expected to perform when you get in the ring and you have a lackluster performance you know, you're probably going to lose because we have set the bar so high and I'm okay with that. 
You know, we've set the bar so high that we have to reach that bar every time. Your fighters are probably a target too. We're absolutely a target, a hundred percent. Sometimes I'll spout off about it, you know, when I get in, in my feelings or whatever. But uh, <laughs> but okay. it, but you it is talk true. That talk is the coach. Yeah, you know, I gotta you gotta defend them too. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and, and I'm a fighter there you <laughs> at go. the core. You know, I'm a fighter. I'm not just I'm not just showing them how to throw punches. I I'm a big fan of of Drake, as many people know. But in his recent album, he said, "People don't pray for you when you're winning." It's true. When you're at the top, people want to dethrone you. Absolutely. I would say some. it is hard to get to the top of whatever industry you're at. I would argue it's harder to maintain, Absolutely. to repeat, yeah, that's, to come back again and again. That, you know, that's the, that's the saying. Anybody can, anybody can win, but who can, who can consistently do that? You know, um, we've had a couple bumps and bruises uh, this year. But we, I've got a couple tricks up the sleeve, yeah. and we're looking to um, looking to really shake things up, closing this year out. How did it feel to be covered in Sports Illustrated 2020? I know that was powerful. Well, first off, congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. And how did that feel? Um, for me, it felt amazing. You know, I always I had a subscription to Sports Illustrated growing up, so never did I think I would be in it, much less be in it with my boys. Um, if you ask Nate and Elijah, hey, man, how does it feel to be in Sports Illustrated? They're just like, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like like the, the gravity of it, I don't even think. It's changed. Yeah. I, but I don't even think they, not that they don't like it. I just don't think they understand, you know what I mean? Like Sports Illustrated. It's like the magazine, you know? Yeah. It's, well, I saw it. I, I, I freaked out. I, yeah. Cause, yeah. I mean, I grew up. Getting the subscription to my, to my front door, opening right, it right. up. I guess things have changed now because they were 17 and 14. So they've grown up with just technology. Just technology. I see. So magazine, that physical copy when you get. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. I, I'm still stoked about it when I watched the video. <laughs> it's a great video, man. A uh, couple last questions about the boxing side. What... What can we and should we expect from from Lugo Boxing's team in the next three to five years? All right. Next three to five years, we are looking to put four to five boxers on the 2024 Olympic team. Yep. Um, shortly after that, um, pro debuts. Um, and then we're looking to, at the end of that five years, um, Looking to fight for our first maybe world title. I'm so excited for you guys, man. It's I'm excited for a few years from now for us to come back and do another interview for you to play this back. Right, right. And you say that you've done it. Now, for people that are listening that are not boxers, that are inspired by your story, two questions. What are some good characteristics of a boxing gym for people if they're going out to try to find something? And then how can people get started? Um so they can go on usaboxing.org and there's a gym locator um, tab. Go on there, put in their area code, see what gyms are close by. Um, make sure that the gym is registered with USA Boxing. That is going to ensure that the coaches in the gym have passed their background screening. And so the background screening, again, it is, you're going to have coaches that have like myself, been through hell and back and have all kinds of stuff on their record. But again, USA Boxing is not about that. USA Boxing is a, is a sport of redemption. Um, what the background check is checking for is for sexual predators. That is something that we do not tolerate. We do not want in our sports. We do not want them around our children. Um, so make sure that the gym you get with is a registered gym with USA Boxing and that all the coaches within that gym are registered as coaches with USA Boxing. Um, especially if you're going to have your, your child around somebody, you need to make sure that they're safe in that aspect. Um, and as far as the gym, you know, you have to feel comfortable. If somebody makes you feel uncomfortable in a gym, 
and and not you know not a boxer or somebody else but the person that is in charge that person who owns that house if they make you feel uncomfortable in that gym you don't need to be there you know find another gym find a place that um that makes you feel good and and then from there you know you can you can, you can build off anything because i've seen a coach that maybe doesn't have as much boxing knowledge but he is a great dude and cares about the people in his house so he's going to go above and beyond it might take him a little longer to to teach and and explain these things but that's what you want you want a good coach a good person that makes you feel comfortable thank you man that's great advice i think that'll really help people get started now we've had you've shared a powerful life story of your of your own and then talked about the boxing We'll wrap up the interview with just some fun, lighthearted questions about cool. Mike Lugo himself. All right. All right. So first thing that comes to your mind, right. let's start with what is an album that defines you? I don't know. Um, I'd have to say uh, Fresh Prince. Yeah. The, the Summertime album back in the day that's good used to be my you know we'd go up summer go up north for the summer and that would be the the song we played when we hit the highway there you go so, cruising and jamming right what's a movie that, that defines you Oof. Yeah. i'll say this um i don't know i like the last samurai good answer that's a great movie. I watched that yeah. just a few months ago. I love that movie. That's so strong. Yeah. What about a book that defines you? 48 Laws of Power. Phenomenal. If you could have five dinner guests, dead or alive, at dinner with you tonight, who are those dinner guests? My father uh, and my grandparents on both sides. That's beautiful. That'd be a beautiful conversation. What is a purchase that you've made under a hundred dollars that you would say has had a huge impact on your life? I bought this um, book. It's like a date book, like you see it on social media. Yeah, right. Where you scratch things off, and it gives you like these. Uh, uh, just different ideas for dates and yeah, yeah, challenges and so that was that was a really good it was good it was great i tried to convince my wife to get it when my son and she said oh that's that's silly so thank you it was great i'm gonna use that now yeah where in the world do you feel most present and mindful and you know ringside mm. yeah you can't be thinking about anything else during that time nope zoned in who has inspired you the most in your life that you have not had a chance to meet yet there's that uh the navy seal dude um david goggins goggins yeah stay hard that dude is that dude is tough I want to see you guys sit down for a conversation. He's tough. I like him. Yeah. He's strong. Yeah. I really like David. What's a skill that you don't have right now that you wish you could learn? Play the piano. I've always wanted to learn how to play the piano. I just haven't had the opportunity. Yeah. I'm not just saying this piano is my favorite too. I, I love it. It's, it's peaceful. Yeah, it's relaxing and peaceful. I'll find myself often listening to piano music, just medleys of different songs, just to relax. Yeah, eventually I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. But you'll at night you'll coach boxing ringside, and afterwards you'll play play the piano to relax. Yeah, everybody. that'd be dope. <laughs> How does Mike Lugo rest and recover? How do you relax? Um, I don't sleep much. Honestly, when you say don't sleep much, what is that? What are you getting in a night? Maybe 
four, Oof. four or five hours at the most. Do you feel functioning off that? Yeah. I mean, I function off it. Um, I don't know. Um, rest escapes me a lot. I would like to get more. <laughs> <laughs> but, don't we uh, all? Yeah. It, I don't know, man. My mind is my mind is a, a thousand miles an hour all the time. Um, if I could ever get to sleep, I, I, I'm, I would be good. It's just, you know, I can't ever get to sleep because I'm always thinking, I'm always planning, I'm always strategizing, what can I do better? And then, and then if we have big fights coming up, then I'll get nervous and think that everybody's training harder than me. And then, yep. then I want to wake everybody up at three in the morning and <laughs> like a true good coach does. <laughs> Well, I get so not really sure you you don't get much rest. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure on that one. What is something that you have not manifested into reality yet, but you are going to? I'm gonna buy the building that we're that our gym is at. Damn right you are. We're gonna buy it. Um, we're gonna turn upstairs into a. I guess a private lounge. So when we come back from our yep. trips, we'll have a place to decompress. Yep. So that's that's what I'm manifesting is to own that that block. When you own that, and in a few years, we'll come back and do the next interview there. Awesome. That'll be the plan. And last question, my man. What do you believe is your edge in life? Um, my edge in life is because I know the answer to the question that I've spray painted on the wall in the gym. And that question, I don't know if you've seen it or paid attention to it, I is have. why do you fight? Um, I know why I fight. I know, I know my purpose. Going back to looking at the stars. For a long time, I, I didn't know. I thought it was something else, but it wasn't. It was close. Um, I know why I fight. Um, and that's to provide guidance and structure to those that need it. When I was a young man, I was looking for me right now, back then. If I would have found me back then, I might not have went to prison. I might not have you know, went through some of the, the hardships that I did. So that's, that's what, that's what makes me, that's what drives me. Um, you know, and, and I think everybody needs to know why they fight. If you don't know why you're fighting, then, then what are you doing? What's your purpose? What's your core? What's your end goal? You know? Um, so that's what it is for me. And I think it's not just why do you fight physically, but why do you fight mentally and emotionally too? Oh, absolutely. Because not that's, everyone's going to be a fighter listening, but everyone that, fights. That is, that is so much, you know, that's so twofold when I say that. Of, of course, physically, but mentally, you know? Like, like with my mom, my mom, you know, they gave her two years to live yeah. in 2018, 2021, you know, she fights because she's not ready to, to lay down. <laughs> she told me, she said, I'm not going nowhere. I'm here to see the Olympics. I'm here to see you guys win your professional fights. I'm not ready to stop living. You know, and and for her and her journey, you know, why do you fight is it takes on that that mental, that spiritual aspect, that spiritual journey. And and again, I know everybody's not a physical fighter and I didn't write it just for boxing. Why do you fight? Why do you continue? Why do you do what you do? If you can if you can answer that, then you're you're halfway there. You know? Absolutely, man. 
And I think everybody needs to look inside of themselves and ask, why do I fight? What am I fighting for? Mike, I'm so deeply appreciative of you coming on today, man. I appreciate you having me, man. Sharing your story, man. I was not ready for that. <laughs> and you are a warrior. You are a leader. And I, along with many, many, many other people, appreciate you for what you do and how you're helping the community. So thank you, brother. Man, I appreciate you having me and uh, just, you know, giving me this opportunity to express myself and and maybe, you know, share a little bit of me that I think the majority of people don't know. They definitely did it. They definitely did it. And your story is really going to help people, man, because to hear not only what you went through, but how you overcame it and are on the other side and are now giving back, man, it, it's going to give a hope to a lot of people. So That's thank good. you. And for everybody that has tuned in and listened and watched today, thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching and, and uh, participating in this with us, guys. Stay on the lookout for Lugo Boxing, Mike Lugo and his team. They are taking the world by storm. You're going to see them on pay-per-view in the next few years. You'll see me ringside with them. <laughs> and oh, yeah. Uh, thank you guys for watching and stay tuned next week for another episode of Find Your Edge. I'll see y'all later. Thank you.